All right. So just to review, just to let everybody know, my name again is Nicole Byram. I'm a registered dietitian with Celiac Canada. Welcome everybody. So a couple of house, housekeeping things off the top. The chat function, which I will actually uh, open up for everybody. Let me know in the chat where you're coming from tonight. I like to see if people are you know, if we're coast to coast, so I'm coming to you from North Vancouver today, very snowy North Vancouver today. We had a huge snowstorm last night and it has snowed all day today, which is um, always exciting for us here in Vancouver. So, um, OK, we've got Ottawa, Halifax, St. John's, Edmonton, Toronto, Guelph, Southern Ontario, Ontario, Surrey, Waterloo, Victoria. Hey, we've got one coast, Victoria, Ottawa. <laughs> yeah, we can't handle the snow. Uh, Winnipeg, Revelstoke, a lot of places here who can handle the snow. Um, I'm still waiting to hear from people on the other coast. I know there's somebody. Um, okay, so welcome. So tonight we are going to be talking about uh, getting started on the gluten-free diet. So I'm going to share my screen and we are going to get rolling. Um, the Q&A at the bottom of your page, that is where you will write in your official questions for tonight. So this cat is relentless. He's going to keep coming back. So at the bottom, I won't be collecting the questions that you put in the chat, but the questions that you put in the Q&A, I will have time at the end of the presentation that will go over that. So this presentation, just so everybody knows, will be an hour. At that point in time, um, I'm going to try to make the presentation time about 45 minutes. And then from there on, we're going to do questions. If you have to leave at the hour mark, because I know life is busy, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, there will be no offense taken from me at all. So please, um, but if you want to stick around and listen to some extra questions, you're more than welcome to do so also. So put those in the Q&A at the very bottom. All right, so let's get started from the beginning. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that this presentation was created on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, including the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And here we promise to live, learn, and share educational experiences on this traditional territory, and we express our very deep gratitude. So these are, of course, the lands out here in Vancouver, um, North Vancouver. Um, you can, uh, I'm sure, are grateful for the lands that you, everybody there across the country is on as well. So celiac class. So we are going to be um, discussing everything celiac tonight. So what is celiac disease? So just a brief refresher, in case any of you are new to this and kind of wonder a little bit about the disease, celiac disease is an autoimmune disease, not an allergy, not a food allergy, although a lot of people do use the term allergy when referencing celiac disease, but it isn't. It's a completely different mechanism in the body. You can see on the left hand side, there's some normal villi and then on the right, there's some damaged villi. So when you have celiac disease and you ingest gluten, the protein, the protein gluten, um, your gut doesn't like it. And over time, those long villi atrophy and you get and it gets damaged. So that long um, at, that long villi uh, has a crypt depth and a villus height. So those are very um kind of technical terms for the finger-like projections in your gut. And here you can see over time how the villi, they shorten and they shorten and they shorten. And that's that atrophying or blunting of the villi to the point where there's not a lot of absorptive surface for nutrients. So when you talk about nutrient deficiencies, malabsorptions with celiac disease, this is the reason why. I always like to give a, an explanation so people understand why they're experiencing symptoms or why they're deficient. Um, it's because this your gut actually loses surface area and absorptive capacity. However, the good news is once you're on that gluten-free diet, this all grows back. Our bodies are amazing and, and your villi will actually re respond by growing back and becoming a healthy gut once again. So this isn't permanent. This is a reversible condition as long as you're on that gluten-free diet. Now, celiac disease runs in families. My husband has celiac disease. My daughter has celiac disease. My mother has celiac disease. My sister-in-law and my niece have celiac disease. So my children are blessed with it coming from both sides. So we're genetically... Um, definitely predisposed to have celiac disease. If you have a first degree relative um, with celiac disease, you are more likely to develop it. 
if you have a first degree relative and, and you personally who are not watching this do not have celiac disease, you should be tested for celiac disease. So all first degree relatives, it is our recommendation and it is protocol to be that you are screened for celiac. So if you've been diagnosed and you have a brother or a sister or a parent or a child who's genetically related to you, then they should be screened for celiac disease with a IgA TTG test, that tissue transglutaminase test just to make sure, because what we're finding is in the evidence, a lot of siblings in particular, so younger kids when they're diagnosed, um, their siblings are getting diagnosed and mo more, most typically they are asymptomatic at the time of diagnosis, which is really interesting. Classic symptoms that people might be experiencing, you may or may not have experienced some of these symptoms. Um, these are the these are the tip of the iceberg. These are the, the, you are the people who are getting diagnosed more easily in our medical system abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss, all those kind of things. And then we have our non-typical or non-classic symptoms, atypical or non-classic. And these are the people who are under the water in the iceberg. You are not getting diagnosed quite so quickly or quite so easily um, because no one symptom, no single symptom is unique to celiac disease. Celiac disease overlaps with so many other conditions and we're labeling it as other things in our medical system. So we don't have any specific, um, there's, if you get, if you have unexplained iron, if you have dental and amble defects, there's other explanations for that within our medical construct. So celiac disease is being missed, which is why we at the CCA are really trying to advocate for increased testing. So we're catching those people who have these non classic or atypical symptoms. So unexplained iron deficiency, 68% of those newly diagnosed with celiac disease have iron deficiency. We know the World Health Organization has recently said that 30% of people globally, females globally have um, iron deficiency anemia, but we're 68%. So that speaks to that villus blunting and that poor absorptive capacity in your gut, lending itself to, um, iron to these anemias and deficiencies. Oral canker sores, one of the primary symptoms that we'll see in, or sorry, dental animal defects, one of the primary symptoms we'll see in children. Um, vomiting, IBS. IBS and celiac disease can coexist. Um, they overlap in tons of symptoms um, and they can coexist together. So they're not, um, they're not uh, necessarily, uh, if you have one, you don't have the other. You can have both, but most, um, when if you think you have IBS, we want to always screen for celiac disease to ensure that it's not, this, not celiac disease that's actually causing the IBS symptoms. Talk to a dietitian about that. Um, high liver enzymes. We see that all the time. Osteopenia, osteo osteoporosis. So we're seeing bone mineral um, density decrease because of lack of vitamin D, lack of calcium absorption into the bone um, because of that villus atrophy. And therefore uh, we're seeing um, early bone fractures, early osteopenia and osteoporosis, delayed puberty and fertility. So these are all classic symptoms that when your gut heals, will all start to reverse. We can reverse most, if not all of these things. And then we have neurological complications. So if any of you ex experience fatigue, brain fog, headaches, dizziness, my husband's primary presentation was dizziness, headaches, brain fog. Um, that was, that was, that those are neurological complications. Most of you have gone through diagnosis, so I won't spend too much time on this, but as we know, screening is the blood test biopsy. So the actual diagnosis is biopsy diagnosis, unless you're a child, in which case we can do a non-biopsy diagnosis. If anybody does have questions about this towards the end, please do ask. I won't spend too much time on it right now, but for kids in BC, actually it's 18 and under, they've started doing this on just because of lack of OR time for endoscopies. Um, we are doing a non-biopsy approach to diagnosis. There is currently no treatment for celiac disease other than the gluten-free diet. So there's no medications. Food is our medicine. I am very hopeful and I am reassured with that hope by many, many uh, researchers who are telling us that there will be medications available. So please keep on your gluten-free diet. Um, knowing that there will be maybe a little bit of breathing room in the future for medication for for potential glutening is what the medications are looking at at the moment. Um, so strict gluten-free diet is lifelong and needs to be strict. We can't, you can't, there's no room for too much error in a gluten-free diet. Um, our gut can handle about 10 milligrams of 
gluten per day before the atrophy starts. So what does that look like? 10 milligrams of gluten looks like about the amount of uh, flour in a pen tip. So a tiny little bit. Uh, we know our gut can tolerate that. That's why our food is 20 parts per million and less is gluten-free. Let's start on labeling. So how do we know when we have celiac disease, what is safe for us or non-celiac gluten sensitivity? There might be some people here who don't have official celiac disease, but do have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. How do we know how to read labels and what is safe for us to eat? There's nothing more daunting than being given a diagnosis like celiac disease and then sent out, you go for your first trip to the grocery store and you're looking around thinking, I don't know what's safe and what's not. So let's go through that and we can um, address some of those questions. So the um, Celiac Canada has developed a labeling guide, which is a fantastic resource. I suggest you print it up. It's a PDF you can get off our website. You can print it up, put it on your fridge and refer to it as needed. I'm gonna walk through um, parts of it right now, but it's a really, really handy resource. We, des we developed a labeling guide because label reading can be confusing. Um, and our labeling guide is based on evidence um, is based and, and Health Canada regulations. So we're really lucky here in Canada that we have Health Canada and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency who both ensure a safe food supply for us. These are two government agencies that ensure that what companies are putting on their labels are in their products and that labeling is done in a way that is consistent and repeatable and um, the, and the same across the board. So there's that, con that consistency is huge down to font size and color of background and color of, of the printing and font. So when you are looking at a label, we want to look for four ingredients, for four main things. We call these brow ingredients. So it's an acronym brow standing for barley, rye, regular oats, and wheat or triticale. Um, you won't see triticale in very many things, but it uh, has to be listed. Um, barley, rye, oats, and that's regular oats and wheat. So these are our brow ingredients and these four things contain the protein gluten and we need to avoid them. In Canada, all priority allergens must be declared on the, on the, on the label and priority allergens. So all priority allergens, gluten sources and added sulfites must be, must be listed. Um, if they're in, so they can be listed in one of two places. So you can see here on the right hand side, we've got an ingredients list. Um, I believe this is a cereal box. Um, ingredients: sugar, unbleached, enriched, enriched flour. Uh, I need to remove that so I can see. Uh, enriched flour bracket wheat flour. So you can see here that wheat is declared in the ingredients list. Um, then there's some B vitamins. Uh, hydrogenated coconut, soybean oil, maybe this isn't a cereal, or malted barley flour. So you can see there's barley there and there's wheat up here. So in the ingredients list, sorry, my cat just bit me. He's such a brat. Um, you can see there's both wheat and barley. So, but in the contains, you can see there's only wheat. So why is barley not listed in the contain statement? And that is because uh, priority allergens, gluten sources and sulfites. So from here on forward, I'll just talk about the gluten sources. Um, gluten sources only have to be listed once, either in the ingredients list or in the contains list. They don't need to be listed in both. So you might see an ingredients list where it just says unble unbleached enriched flour, and there's no bracket. Um, and then in the contains, it would say wheat. So watch for that, but don't just look at the contains and say, oh, well, I don't see any gluten sources. We do see it here, of course, but if you didn't, don't assume that it's not there. So you do have to look in both the ingredients list and the contain statement. And it is mandatory if that product contains a brow ingredient, it does have to be listed there. So that's a gluten source. It has to be listed in one of those two places. Um, now, a contain statement is not the same as a precautionary or a may contain statement. So a may contain statement, you'll see these on a lot of products. It'll say, uh, may contain may contain wheat or made in a process a facility that also processes wheat or manufactured on equipment. 
These are the may contain statements. These are not mandatory statements, but rather they're precautionary statements where a company feels that they've done their due diligence, they have followed good manufacturing practices, but there is still a risk to the consumer that there may be a source of contamination in that food from a gluten source. So this is where precautionary uh, statements are, are good for us and we take heed with them. So if you see a precautionary statement on a product, they are not safe for somebody with celiac disease. Now, in our minds, we might say that a may contain one, a may contain precautionary statement is um, more risky to us than made in a facility or manufactured on equipment. I will, I will caution you that there's no hierarchy in risk when it comes to the various precautionary statements and companies do not have a hierarchy of risk when it comes to those precautionary statements either. They're all equal in risk value, and we have to avoid them regardless of which one of those three statements is printed on, on, the, on the label. So um, it is our recommendation from Celiac Canada that we do not consume foods that have a may contain our uh, maiden facility or any precautionary statement on it because there is a risk for contamination of, of a gluten source and therefore would not be safe for somebody and you could get very sick. So um, keep that in mind and precautionary statements must be truthful and clear. And as I said, they must follow good manufacturing practices. Companies are not supposed to just slap these on because they don't want a lawsuit. That's not the purpose of a precautionary statement. The purpose of a precautionary statement is to let somebody know who has uh, an allergy or uh, celiac disease or some other food intolerances to let them know that there's the possible presence of this in their food. Um, here's an example of a precautionary statement. So you can see here there are da, 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 no brow ingredients in the ingredients list. So you might go, okay, that's great. No, there's no brow ingredients in the contains. However, when you go down to the may contains, there is a brow ingredient right here. So we have wheat, so this product would not be safe for consumption. Um, gluten can never be hidden in a food. Now, these are really small. I have to, uh, tonight is the first night that I've given this specific presentation. Um, we used a different presentation before, so I'm learning a little bit as I go here tonight um, of what needs to be changed. And I, oh, now can you guys see that if I zoom it in? I wonder. Um, so gluten and I really want to be clear on this. We can't hide gluten in a food. Gluten, so if it's not in the ingredients list, if it's not in a contained statement, if it's not in a precautionary statement, it can't be hidden by some other funny word. So I'll give you an example of that because I don't feel like that was very clear. We have to label either barley, rye, regular oats, or wheat. Going back to those and I'll use the three example again. Going back to Health Canada has regulated that all precaution, all priority allergens, so things like milk, crustaceans, mustard seed, peanuts, um, egg, soy, those are all priority allergens. And then we have another category. Those are our gluten sources. Those are our brow ingredients. And then we have sulfites. We cannot call barley by any other name on a label it has to be clearly labeled as barley. So if there is yeast extract, bracket barley, barley has to be in the bracket following the yeast extract so that the consumer knows there's barley in this product. It would be against labeling regulations if that company did not include that. That's what I mean when I say gluten can never be hidden in a food. We cannot say, so let's look at that middle ingredient, in middle, that red label in the middle. So whole oat flour, so this would already be not allowed because oat is, and that's regular oats, that is a brow ingredient, so we know that wouldn't be allowed. Modified food starch. So maybe you go and you say modified food starch. Well, I don't know what that is. Does that contain gluten? So you might be, you know, going to your pocket dictionary or going to your gluten-free 24, gluten 24 seven app, which we'll talk about later. And you might be saying, does this, does this, does this ingredient have gluten in it? The other way you can do that is just knowing that here in Canada, barley, rye, oats, and wheat have to be labeled labeled clearly. So unless there's a bracket, wheat, a bracket, or a bracket with another brown ingredient following that ingredient, it does not contain it. Um, you know, 
there's a lot of it. There's a lot of things like try sodium phosphate. I mean, what is that? Who, what, what the heck is that? So maybe you're going, how do I know? How do I know that doesn't include, that's not a gluten source. Again, it would have to have a bracket following to let you know that that's, that, that item on the ingredients list contains gluten. I hope that's clear. If it's not, let me know at the end and I can describe it a little bit more. So now we have our gluten-free certifications. So what is the difference between a gluten-free certification and a gluten-free claim on a label? At the end of the day, for the consumer, both are safe. If something says on it, just printed at the bottom, gluten-free, made without gluten, contains no gluten, all of these things mean the same. Here in Canada, as long as there, there is an uh, as long as that label is indicating that this is a gluten-free product, it is a gluten-free product and it has to have been tested to be so. I've checked this with Health Canada myself and I, and the, and Celiac Canada, excuse me, is uh, advocating for a single claim statement. So in the, U in the UK, in Australia, only gluten-free or a GF symbol is what people can write on a product. They can't say made without gluten. They can't say contains no gluten. Because to me, those are a little ambiguous. Um, and I feel a little less secure when I buy products like that, because I feel like there's a back door where companies could say, oh, that's not what we meant. But according to Health Canada, if it's written like that in any form, then it has to have been tested to be gluten-free. So we go with that. Um, but I do think that it would be a much easier um, if we had a single claim statement. So anything that has glu gluten-free on it is safe. Now we have our certifications as well. These are like the gold standard of gluten-free certifications. So they're ensuring, so not only are they below 20 parts per million, they're below 10 parts per million. Um, and so looking at our certification, so this is our old celiac, Canadian Celiac Association one, but um, ours is celiac, our new one would say celiac Canada. Our facility is is, um, sorry, my dryer is going behind me and I hope it's not distracting everybody. My kids are all upstairs. It's been a snow day here. So I'm hiding in the basement again. Um, but the facility is certified, not just the product. So what that means is it's just easier for, for them to bring in uh, other food items into the facility and the entire facility is, is, uh, is regulated. So there's a few, a few subtle differences, um, but there's, it's like a, it's like an extra, extra bit of comfort when there's a certification there. Um, okay, so this is from our labeling guide. So Celiac Canada's labeling guide, which you can get on the website, celiac.ca. And this is just one of the handy little graphs that's within this uh, labeling guide. So let's go through each line item to see, to kind of test our, test our knowledge. So if something has no gluten-free claim on it, but has no gluten containing ingredients, so those are the brow ingredients, then this product would be allowed. If there is no gluten-free claim and it has a contain statement for a brow ingredient, it's not allowed because we know it contains a brow ingredient. No gluten-free claim, no gluten containing ingredients, but it does have a may contain, not allowed. We've gone over that. Anytime there's a gluten-free claim on a product, it is allowed. Anytime you see gluten-free on a product, you can have it. It has been tested to be less than 20 parts per million, and it is safe for your consumption. Which brings us to the next line, a gluten-free claim and a may contain or a precautionary label. This one gets a lot of people. And to be honest, in the past, it's got me too. And I've looked at it and I thought, well, this is a mistake. How on earth can something may contain a brow ingredient and be gluten-free at the same time? And we have to go back a few slides to remember that Health Canada has regulations for priority allergens, gluten sources, and sulfites. So people with a wheat allergy. So wheat lives in two of those categories. Wheat lives in the gluten sources and wheat lives in the priority allergens. People who have an anaphylactic wheat allergy can tolerate no gluten at all, or no wheat at all, sorry, zero. People with celiac disease can tolerate 20 parts per million, that 10 milligram threshold, which I talked about. So some a product that says gluten-free on it, but also has a may contain, that product is warning people with an anaphylactic wheat allergy that it is not safe for them. 
but it is considered safe for somebody with celiac disease because it is tested below that 20 parts per million, which we know is the safe threshold for somebody with celiac disease. Final line is products that are made in a bakery that also make gluten containing flour, gluten, gluten, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been talking all day. Gluten containing products. So we've got an incredible bakery um, here in North Valley, in Edgemont Village, if any of you are, are local. Um, and it makes delicious gluten-free macaroons. They, they, they call them gluten-free macaroons. But surrounding them are scones and croissants and cookies and you name it. And so my husband, who used to love this little bakery or little shop, um, when he was diagnosed, he thought, okay, well, I can still have the macaroons. Great. So we can still go. I can still have the experience. But then you watch behind the counter and they're sharing the tongs and you think, oh my goodness, they're put they're they're getting the croissant and they're pulling it over top. And there's, there's just crumbs everywhere. And then you worry about the kitchen, the facility that it was produced in there. It's not a big one. And they're making everything in the back and there's flour, there's airborne flour. And we know that whenever there's airborne flour, it's got to land somewhere. So where is it landing? Is it landing on the macaroons? Is it landing, you know, on one of my gluten-free products? So gluten-free products made in a bakery that also produce gluten-containing products is not allowed. If you go somewhere and there's a pet little package, it's been brought in from somewhere else, totally different situation, totally different scenario. But if they're made in the same place, take heed. Okay, let's go over some allowed food labels so that we know what can we eat. I've talked a lot about what we can't eat and what's not safe, but let's look at a couple of labels that we can eat. Nuts are good, cashews, almonds, sugar, maltodextrin, again, maltodextrin, dextrose. You might go that look at those and go, do those contain gluten? Remember, there'd have to be a bracket after them with a brow ingredient in that bracket if it contained it. Same with xanthan gum, like what the heck? Have Would have to contain a bracket if that product had it in it. So trust the label and trust that there's no gluten sources in here at all. So cashews, almonds, is it contains, and then there's a may contain other tree nuts. This product looks completely safe to me. Um, okay, this one on the other, on the right-hand side, water, long grain parboiled rice, dehydrated veggies. The thing here that would get me, or when I counsel people on this, is yeast extract. Remember, I use this as an example that it would have to be yeast extract bracket barley if that yeast extract was made from barley. So both of these are safe labels. These are our labels that we should avoid. Rolled oats, oat syrup may contain wheat. So again, if oats are in the ingredient list, they have to say may can, they have to say gluten-free oats. It's only here in Canada, but they do have to say gluten-free oats and that package would have to be labeled gluten-free as well to make those oats safe. Regardless, it has a may contain wheat in it. So this would not be allowed. Oats again, oats here. So contains oat ingredients, not safe. Um, okay, now we're gonna talk about understanding the risk level of certain foods and then tips on being gluten-free at home and dining out safely. So um, I'm gonna move my little picture there. Um, okay, so some foods have higher risk levels of others. So we talked about safe labeling and how to know if something is safe or not when you're in the grocery store. But there's a handful of things that we need to just memorize and need to know are higher risk and we need to get them gluten-free in order for us to be safe. So um, items, so regular oats we've talked about to nauseam. So we know that those aren't safe, but grains, flours, um, grains and flours and certain and starches, which we'll talk about pulses, flax and hemp seeds. So um, the reason that some of these are going to be higher risk is because of cross is because of cross contamination um, in manufacturing, you know, anywhere from farm to table, but generally in the manufacturing area. So um, grains, flowers and starches. So if you are getting um arrowroot flour, if you are getting tapioca flour, if you are getting corn flour, if you are getting corn meal, all of these things should be listed gluten-free. The reason for that is the milling of them puts it at higher risk for cross-contamination. So anytime you buy a bag of flour um, or um, in this would be gluten-free crackers, pastas, 
um, cookies, anything made with flowers will have to say gluten-free on them. Now, this sounds like a big deal, but it's really not. Most things that you are going to purchase that contain gluten-free flowers are going to have a gluten-free label on it, or they're going to contain wheat. Very rarely do I actually see products out there that look gluten-free, but they're not labeled gluten-free. If a company is trying to make a gluten-free product, they're going to be pretty obvious about it. And if not, they're going to use they're going to use wheat because it's typically cheaper. So, and the gluten and wheat makes the texture of things better at, you know, unfortunately. Um, so starches be, is, is in there. Now, if starch is an ingredient in a food, that's no problem. We don't need to worry about it being gluten-free, but if you're buying starch on your own, just make sure that you're buying it um, from the grocery store in a container and not from, um, not from bulk bins, not from, um, uh, that could be imported, um, in little baggies. Sometimes you can go to, you can go to shops and they're in little, like in little baggies in little like mom and pop shops. Um, so just being aware that we need to see an ingredients list to know that it's safe. Anytime you buy something, make sure you can see an ingredients list to know what's safe. Otherwise, we're not sure what's in there. Um, pulses, so lentils in particular. When you're buying dried pulses, ideally buy them with a gluten-free claim. There are ways around this. So lentils, I we eat a lot of lentils. Often, um, I, I usually actually buy my gluten-free lentils on Amazon because I often can't find them in the grocery store. If in a pinch, you don't have time to order from Amazon and you go to, you, or out, we're out here in, in Vancouver. So if I go to Save On or Safeway and I end up getting um, just regular lentils, pour them on a cookie sheet and shake the cookie sheet so the lentils are all evenly distributed and eyeball it. Look for any rogue, rogue grain. So anything that looks different, take it out. You know, you may or may not find anything. Occasionally people do. And then rinse those. Rinse the lentils really well. Rinse the dried beans really well. Rinse the dried chickpeas really well. Whatever it may be, rinse it really well to make sure there's no cross-contamination from dust from, uh, from uh, manufacturing on there. And then they're fine. So we want them, A, these things can be really expensive. Gluten-free can be more expensive often. So if you can't afford it, this is another way of doing that. So regular oats always have to be purchased gluten-free. Um, things containing the grains and flours. So the, again, those are the cookies, the pastas, the cake mixes, um, that sort of thing. And then flax and hemp seeds. So hemp seeds have actually, sorry, flax seeds have actually been shown to be extraordinarily cross-contaminated in the research and the studies. So buy those gluten-free as well as hemp seeds. Again, I am pressed to find gluten or hemp seeds and flax seeds that don't actually carry a gluten-free claim. Usually they do. Um, the, the place that you would get flax seeds without would be a bulk, a bulk bin. Um, but most of them do. So they're not hard to find, but just keep these in mind that these are four things, four, I, four categories that need to be purchased gluten-free. People all often ask about rice and they often ask about nuts. Do I need to purchase rice with a gluten-free claim? No, you don't. So rice is not grown uh, in an area where there would be cross-contamination like, um, like other grains in the fields. There's a lot of uh, crop rotation and cross-contamination within that. That's why oats are so cross-contaminated. Rice isn't like that. Um, however, you can buy a lot of rice packages. There's a lot of seasoning in, in those rice packages. So read the ingredients list, just like you would any other list. And um, that way you will know if it's safe or not. Look for your brown ingredients. Not to the same thing. Um, not typically grown in areas in rotation with gluten-containing grains. So you don't need to worry about buying them with a gluten-free claim. However, read the ingredients list on them. Make sure there's not a precautionary label or it contains on there because there can be different seasonings on nuts. This is an incredible resource. If you, I think it's a $5 one-time fee and it's just awesome. So if you are concerned about being in the grocery store and not, and, and you don't really feel like you're comfortable enough to do the label labeling guide and just rely on kind of those brow ingredients. And you really do want to inspect certain ingredients to just to, I, I get it. You want to have that, that gut kind of reassurance. This is amazing. Um, it's an app where you just, you know, carry it with you. It's like having a dietitian in your pocket. You carry it with you and then you punch in whatever ingredient you're wondering about, and it'll tell you if it's gluten-free 
or if there's, you know, it, it could potentially contain gluten, in which case it'll go into an explanation about that or whether it is gluten and you should not have it. Okay, so um, those are, that's a great tool to use and I highly suggest you pick it up. Okay, gluten-free in your home. How do you live safely with family members who have, who can eat gluten or um, have celiac disease? So depending on which side of the of the gluten um, story you're on here. I um, don't have celiac disease, my daughter and my husband do. There's five of us in the house, two out of five have it. We have a shared kitchen. However, we primarily eat gluten-free with the exception of a few things. And we have our gluten section in the cupboard. So first thing you wanna do is go out and get yourself your own toaster. Um, we don't share toasters in the gluten, gluten world, gluten-free world. We, um, unless you have toaster bags, you might want to, you might be able to use a toaster oven and then just make sure that the, that the things are clean every time the, the tray is clean every time or whatever it is that you, that you put it on. Um, but toaster bags are a great travel tip too, by the way, an excellent thing to bring when you're traveling. If you've got like a one bedroom somewhere, bring, bring those. Cause you're not going to have a separate toaster. Um, or just some tin foil in the oven you can use as well as uh, to toast your bread. Keep containers of gluten-free grains and baking supplies labeled and away from gluten sources. So depending on um, how you do your kitchen, I the recommendation is to keep all gluten-free items above gluten containing items. So we never want, we, we always want to think about gravity. We never want gluten containing items falling on top of gluten-free items. We want to keep our gluten-free items pristine we don't want gluten falling on them. So if you have gluten containing stuff, sealed containers in the bottom shelf, not in the top shelf. Soap and water or the dishwasher is how you clean your pots and pans and cooking utensil, cooking utensils. Um, we don't need to do anything special here, guys. Uh, we Washing our dishes is fine. You don't need to go to any extra length. The dishwasher or hand washing will remove gluten. Be aware of deeply grooved wooden utensils and cutting boards. Um, this is your the grandmother's cutting board that's been passed along. Or I know some houses out there, I don't know if they, I don't, I'll probably be laughed at, but do you remember when houses used to have right under the countertop, there'd be a cutting board that would slide out? Did any of you have those? My parents' house that I grew up in before we did our kitchen reno when I was a teenager, we had one of those. And it was like the coolest thing. And I remember when we moved into the house thinking it was the greatest thing. Um, but you'd pull it out and then you'd use it. But of course, this thing never got washed. So it was so deeply grooved and disgusting. And it would just have been a beautiful place for gluten to hide and live. So same goes for those old kind of chunky cutting boards. If there's a lot of grooves in them, gluten could live in those. So wash things really well, visually inspect them, make sure they're safe. I don't want people to go out and spend a whole lot of money here, but just being aware of the risk assessment. Everything in your new world is gonna be about risk assessment. Is this a low risk choice or is this a high risk choice? Um, colanders, let's not share colanders. They can, like I've seen pasta plug up the holes in those colanders and then that plug, if it gets into yours, and you eat that can make you sick. So just be aware of that. Um, air fryers, convection ovens, anytime there's blowing air, I, I hear my husband actually, he's brought using our air fryer right now. It's a dedicated air fryer. Anytime there's circulating air, we need to be aware that gluten, if, was, if it was previously in it, could be getting blown around and therefore deposited on your gluten-free food. Um, separate butter dishes, anything that you are going to put a, a knife in and then spread it on wheat or somebody in your house will, and then put it back into the container needs to be changed. So squeeze waddles are beautiful for, for, you know, the condiments, mayo, mustard, ketchup, relish, all that kind of stuff, but things like jams and jellies less likely to get and butter less likely to get squeeze containers. We're not going to get that. So separate or label, label them. We jiffy marker the heck out of everything. In truth, everything in our fridge is gluten-free dedicated. If gluten comes into contact with it by accident, then it gets jiffy markered the heck up so that nobody is going to grab it and not see that this says wheat exclamation mark, exclamation mark on it or contaminated exclamation mark. Um, and the reason I say Sharpie is because Sharpies are not going to, are not going to wash off. They're not going to wear off or just label maker, 
or something else. You can come up with your own thing. On our YouTube channel, we've got a shared kitchen webinar, which is now called cross-contamination webinar. And you can find it. So our Celiac Canada YouTube. And this is about 15 minute walkthrough of a kitchen, my kitchen, to let you know how to safely coexist to make sure everybody's safe. It's one that, um, yeah, I hope you watch because it really does walk through how to organize your cupboards, how to make sure you're, you know, if you're cooking and using two pots, not sharing uh, the same spoon. If somebody's eating crackers, how do I clean it up off my countertop safely? So for that, I will say um, I use a lot of paper towel. If there's a, a gluteny mess, a lot of paper towel, and then it goes into the green bin rather than using my kitchen cloth and having contamination on that, um, which could then be, and I've got small, I've got small kids um, and teenagers. So both aren't super cautious about, um, you know, before they use some, use the kitchen sponge, they don't rin rinse it really well. So just being aware of everything. Dining out. Um, this is a tricky one for people. Dining out can be difficult. And it's one of the top three issues when we polled our, our community, travel, dining out and label reading were three of the biggest concerns. Um, dining out is part of quality of life. And we really want to make sure that everybody is living their best life. But that empowerment piece of what questions do I ask, how do I know where to go, is important. Truth be told, when you dine out, you're putting your safety in somebody else's hands. You're at the vulnerability of the kitchen's knowledge. So um, call ahead. You can call ahead, find out what does the kitchen do? What menu items do you suggest? Um, when you go to the restaurant, um, ask your server, you know, what what items on the menu do you think are best for me um, for gluten-free? Uh, do you have a dedicated fryer? Is there like pots of water? So one thing I ask, cause my daughter does like to get gluten-free pasta when we go somewhere and I, when we go to restaurants and I do know some restaurants will just have a constant pot of boiling water and then they do, and then they use um, that over and over again. So is my pasta gonna be cooked in fresh water? Is it gonna have a fresh colander? Um, the best is when they have a dedicated fryer and you can actually get the French fries. So we have a couple of places here that we know we can go and we frequent them often. Uh, and you're going to do the same. You're going to figure out where the, where your favorite dining locations are going to be. And you're going to go there as a regular, on a regular basis, because you feel comfortable. Um, ask like how, what's happening in the kitchen to make sure is it, is my food being prepared in a separate section? And sometimes the server might not know. And it's okay if you say, um, can I speak to a manager? Or in some travel locations, I'll actually send a chef out. Whenever we've gone to, we're frequent Disney um, people. We go to Disney every year. And I've actually got, if any of you are traveling to Disney, uh, we've got a Disneyland video uh, to help you navigate dining out at Disney um, on your travels. That they'll send the chef out who will go over everything with you. If it's a buffet, they'll send the chef out and walk you through the buffet to tell you what's safe and what's not. But in a pinch here in Canada, if if the chef won't come out, which they likely won't in a restaurant here because they're too busy, um, they just don't have the staff to support it. And your server doesn't seem to be um, understanding your concerns. Ask to speak to a manager and just say, I'm really concerned um, about this and I want to make sure myself or my parent or my child uh, or my friend is safe. So having those conversations, those are some questions. Okay, I'm aware of our time. Um, some frequently ask, asked questions. So I wanted to go through these. Some of them we've talked about already. Lotions and cosmetics. I get asked this all the time. Can I put, do, does my lipstick have to be gluten-free? Does my chapstick have to be gluten-free? Does my mascara have to be gluten-free? Does my hand lotion have to be gluten-free? No, the answer is no to all of those things. So in, unless you're planning on dining on those, um, so research has showed that you have to eat about six tubes of lipstick. If that lipstick in fact contains a gluten source to breach that 20 parts per million threshold, gluten cannot pass through the skin. Uh, you have to ingest it. So it has to go in, get into your digestive system somehow. So that's ear, nose, and throat. That's the only way we can get to our digestive system. You breathe it in. So that's why we talk about airborne flour. So if somebody is cooking with loose flour in your house, which I highly suggest they don't, we are a flour-free household, except for gluten-free flours. I won't allow regular flour into this house because it's airborne. And um, I don't want, if you breathe it in, 
that, and then you swallow, and then now it's into your digestive system. Lotions don't do that. Okay, you. the argument then would be, but I put something on my lips, I'm licking it. The amount is so, so, so minuscule that it's not a risk. Medications, keep taking your medications. Never stop taking your medications, first and foremost. Um, next, let your pharmacist know, I have been diagnosed with celiac disease. Uh, therefore, I can't have any brow ingredients. Um, let them know. They will alert you if there is any any issue with it, okay? Um, medications are extremely important and very rarely will there be a gluten source in them. So it's a very, very, very low risk, but let your pharmacist know. We talked about may contain statements. We talked about convection ovens. Um, we talked about testing alcohol. A lot of people ask questions. Can I have a glass of wine? Can I have a, can I have, um, you know, hard, hard alcohol? Um, yes, you can. The alcohol you cannot have is, is beer. And you also cannot have gluten reduced beers. Okay. There's a lot of, um, you know, and there's this myth out there that Corona is fine because it tests in at less than 20 parts per million, not safe contains barley. Anytime barley is actually actively used as an ingredient in a food, it's not safe. Um, so alcohol. Um, okay. So rye, why can I drink rye? Why can I drink whiskey? The distillation process of alcohol removes the gluten particle. So distilled alcohols are safe. Wine is safe. Um, there's some barley malt drinks that you cannot have. Um, but, but beer is the big one and gluten reduced beers. You can have gluten free beers though, because they're generally made with something different. Oats we talked about, but the introduction of oats is a conversation that we haven't had. So when you're newly diagnosed, so there's a couple of things we can do here. For those of you who don't mind, if you eliminate oats, that's what we recommend. You go oat free until your TTG has normalized and then you reintroduce oats. I'll tell you why we suggest this. There's a certain subset of our, of our celiac population that responds negatively to oats, not negatively in the way that their villi is gonna be continuously damaged and not negatively in the way that their TTG is gonna be affected. However, negatively in the fact that they are still symptomatic and they're wondering why they're not getting better. They could be having an issue with oats. I recently had a patient who um, A, was seronegative celiac disease. So it was tested um, through biopsy, discovered that way. And oats were a big concern um, in their diet. Um, and when we pulled oats out, their gut improved immensely. So oats can trigger symptoms. Now, the other side of that coin is, okay, I've gone gluten-free, I'm feeling a lot better and I'm still eating oats. Do I have to cut them out? My answer to that would be probably not. If you are asymptomatic once you've gone and, you, and you're doing fine, then we probably don't need to eliminate oats. So you can take this from one of two perspectives. You can, when you're diagnosed, eliminate oats, wait till your TTG is normalized until you're feeling well, reintroduce oats, see how you do, see how you feel. That's option one. Option two um, is go gluten-free, keep eating oats. If you're not getting better, then you can take oats out. Up to you how, what approach you wanna do. Our official recommendation is that you remove oats until your TTG is normalized and then, and then you reintroduce them. But for a lot of kids, that's really hard. It's really hard when our kids are suddenly not allowed to eat a whole lot of food and we're taking out oats, which is in most of the gluten-free treats for them. So I empathize with that. And there is a way around that. Um, if you wanted to talk more about that, uh, you can ask a question, um, put it in the Q&A. Lactose intolerance. So when we are uh, first diagnosed, as mentioned, there's a lot of villus atrophy and lactase, the lactase enzyme lives at the end of the villi. So when you're looking, um, if this is my, my villi, lactase enzymes lives, live here. So when you eat or you eat cheese or you drink milk or you eat yogurt, um, the lactase enzyme digests the lactose, okay, sugar. When you have atrophied your villi, there's no lactase enzyme. So the lactose comes in and it makes your stomach grumbly and it makes you gassy and it makes you have diarrhea and it makes you uncomfortable. When your gut responds and, re and you know, grows back and the lactase enzyme comes back, you can digest lactose again. So there's two groups of people here. Th those who are just lactose-free, 
who are lactose intolerant no matter what. It has nothing to do with their celiac disease. They are just lactose intolerant. And then there's cohort two who are lactose intolerant because of their celiac disease. I don't know which one you are. I don't know if you're having trouble with lactose at all, but um, if you didn't used to have a symptom, an issue with lactose and now suddenly you do, chances are once your gut is healed, you'll be fine again. A few myths we'll quickly go through. Celiac disease is easy, easily recognized. It is not. In fact, people go about 10 years without diagnosis most of the time, because as I mentioned, there's about 260 symptoms of celiac disease and none of them are unique to the disease itself. Uh, it, this is not a childhood disease. Celiac disease can be diagnosed at any time. Oldest person ever diagnosed with celiac disease was 101. Celiac disease can be outgrown. This is a myth. We cannot outgrow celiac disease. It is a lifelong autoimmune disease with the only known treatment being a gluten-free diet. Oats are allowed on a gluten-free diet. Well, this is, this is kind of uh, regular oats. It, this is the myth. Regular oats are not, but uncontaminated oats are okay. Now, our, um, we have a newly diagnosed pathway. For those of you um, who are interested, this is a free program. I am going to click on the link and it will take us to our website. And here is the sign up. So sign up for the program. This is a free program. We are just re revamping and it should be out anytime now. So I might say, if you can hold off on signing up for a couple of weeks, I'm hoping to have the shorter version out. So what we've done is this used to be a year long program. We're finding the year was a little bit burdensome for some people and we have, um, I've condensed it. So we've combined the recipe slides into the other emails and we've made it a bit of a shorter pathway. So you can learn more, more uh, quickly in a shorter period of time. So, but this is a free resource. I highly recommend you sign up for it. It is a fantastic way to get information. Um, and it comes with a lot of videos. It comes with a lot of handouts comes with a ton of perks. So uh, please do check that out, um, www.celiac.ca. Okay, that concludes the presentation. I am going to get to um, some questions. So I'm gonna go to the Q&A. Um, okay, Aliyah, hello. What is the difference between an allergy and an autoimmune within the body? Okay, so different processes entirely. So an allergy is an, IG, an, IG, an IgE response. Um, tends to be more respiratory, tends to be more anaphylactic, hives, itchiness, that sort of thing. Autoimmune diseases come in a totally different category. So think about type one diabetes, um, celiac disease, lupus, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, just entirely different mechanism of action in the body. Um, are there certain items that always have triticale that have triticale or most likely have them. Honestly, I've never seen triticale in a food item. Apparently it's in some granola bars. I've never seen it. Um, just look out for it, but it's not commonplace. Uh, Christina, are there any name, are there any names for any brow ingredients that get called something else on labels? No. So again, we'll just, I just want, I really like to drill this point home. If you don't hear anything else tonight, this is one of the most important things. Gluten cannot be hidden in a food. So we cannot call barley, rye, oats, or wheat by any other name. It's a legally binding name. Health Canada has made sure of that. So if, if there is barley, rye, oats, or wheat in something, it has to be listed by that common name. Harpreet, um, I have silent celiac and I'm not having any digestive systems. If I were to completely avoid gluten, then I may start, oh, if I would completely avoid gluten, then I may start experiencing digestive systems when I have to eat a little bit of gluten in some emergency situations. Is this okay to eat a little bit of gluten maybe once a month? How much would affect my body? Harpreet, thank you for asking this question. This is super important um, because there are, there are the, although, you have celiac disease or you don't, there isn't, there isn't, um, you know, we, we equate it to you're pregnant or you're not. There's no halfway point here. You are, or you aren't, you have celiac disease or you don't. However, there is a spectrum of symptoms you might have. This is why I, I went over the symptoms at the beginning. You might be symptomatic where you have a tiny speck of gluten and you're rushing to the bathroom or you're vomiting 
or you have massive brain fog or you get migraines or it sends you to the hospital. A friend of mine, she gets, she has to go to the hospital um, because she, um, you know, you could have other, you might have neurological complications where you, the ataxia or, you know, there's, there's 260 symptoms. It doesn't matter if you present with symptoms or not, the damage is being done. Okay. So I'm going to say that one more time. It doesn't matter how severe your symptoms are. Your gut is responding in the same way. Our symptoms are unique to ourselves and our symptoms come on a spectrum of asymptomatic, like you are silent, to somebody who has the tiniest bit and they're vomiting profusely. My poor daughter is that person. Um, but the damage is the same. So no, unfortunately, Harpreet, I wish I could say to you, yes, you can cheat once a month. Yes, you can have a little bit once a month. There is no safe amount for people with celiac disease. Any amount of gluten over 10, over 10 milligrams per day is going to damage your gut and cause long-term potential long-term complications. We want to prevent those potential long-term complications. What are they? Uh, long-term complications include things like osteoporosis, osteopenia, certain cancers of the digestive system, lymphoma. Um, those are the scary ones. Um, and when you go gluten-free, your risk goes back to normal. Um, uh, iron deficiency anemias, um, worsening of skin conditions. There's lots and lots of long-term complications that we want to avoid. So no amount is safe for anybody. Christina, can you explain the difference between regular oats and oats that are safe for a gluten-free diet if someone has celiac disease? So great question again. Regular oats are regular oats. Gluten-free oats um, come in two forms. They come in optically or mechanically sorted, and then they come in purity protocol oats. Purity protocol oats um, are from gluten-free. Um, sorry, I'm going to start that again. Gluten purity protocol oats are from fields that are dedicated fields from dedicated manufacturing plants in dedicated transport trucks, dedicated equipment. It's dedicated from far farm to table. Optically sorted are regular oats that have been optically or mechanically sorted to remove any gluten containing pieces. Both are considered safe. If I had a personal preference, I would go for purity protocol. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. But there are a lot of regulations in place to ensure that gluten, that oats that are labeled gluten-free are safe to be, to be consumed by people with celiac disease. Anything that is labeled gluten-free in Canada is intended for the use of people with celiac disease. That's its intent. That's why it says that. That is why it's there. There is a specific dietary purpose to that statement. It's made for us and they've been tested to be safe. Hope that answered your question. Um, I It is five o'clock. If anybody um, has to go, by all means, please feel free. Thank you for joining us here tonight. We will send the presentation to your inbox in the next few days. And I hope you have a lovely, um, lovely evening and stay safe. For those of you who wanna stay for the rest of the questions, uh, please feel free to do so. So Danielle says, what to do if there's a product that doesn't have any gluten in the ingredients, but isn't certified gluten-free? Should I avoid them anyways, like baking powder, for example, or a sauce, even if it doesn't say may contains or contains? So Danielle, great question. Going back to the labeling guide, um, we would say, so a sauce, if there's no gluten containing ingredients in the ingredients list or a contains list or in the contains or a may contain, it would be safe. Um, baking powder. Let's talk about baking powder then for a second. It's such a tiny amount that you use that we don't, we don't worry about it. It's not something we need to be concerned about. Quantity and frequency are two big things you think about with celiac disease. How much am I eating and how often am I eating it? Baking powder is so tiny. Again, we go back. There's another video that I, can you stop Chris Julie? Sorry. Um, my daughter's playing with our two dogs behind me and it's, I'm quite loud. Um, there's another video on our YouTube channel and it's the 20 parts per million and 10 milligram threshold. And it, uh, talks to you about safe amounts of the, t those, these foods. So how much, how many of these foods can I eat? So baking powder. Okay. So it's a loose 
flour-like substance. So we would actually consider it to be a risk. But because baking powder, you use like a quarter teaspoon in a loaf, it's not a risk. It's it's a low risk item purely based on the fact that the quantity of it is so low, it's so tiny. Um, so in the with the exception of those high risk products that I talked about, black seed, hemp seeds, um, the flours and grains and the pulses, everything else is safe, Danielle, to choose without a gluten-free label on it. I hope that makes sense. Um, Alia, at the one year anniversary, how much gluten-free oats should I try to see if I, if it still has an effect on me? Could a person who can't handle gluten-free oats for years start handling it one day? If you are the subset of the population that cannot tolerate the protein in oats, then you probably won't ever be able to tolerate the protein in oats. I would try a small amount, Aliyah, if you want to. You're not gonna be doing any any um, mucosal damage. You're not gonna be right, um, doing any uh, increasing of your TTG. So don't worry about that, but you might be symptomatic. So I would trial it on a day where you know you don't have to do anything, you don't have to be anywhere. Um, but chances are, if you've been unable to tolerate it for that this long, that you're not going to be able to tolerate it moving forward, unfortunately. Danielle, understood with the air fryer and convection ovens, but I'm wondering about other appliances. My fiance is not celiac, but I am. What precautions should we take with the microwave and oven? Should we use the oven at the same time if our food's on different trays? If he uses one of the appliances before me, do I need to wipe it down? Okay, so microwave's no problem. Um, ovens, we want to look out for that convection oven. If you're using just a regular bake function, then um, you're fine. We're not using circulating air. If you are cooking things at the same time in your oven, we're going to use the gravity rule. Think about gravity rule, gravity, gravity. Gluten-free is going to go on top. Gluten containing is going to go on the bottom. So if something happens to fall down, it's not falling on your food. To be extra cautious, you might want to cover it. Um, then you're Then you're really safe, but no. Two things can go in the oven at the same time. It feels uncomfortable. At least it feels uncomfortable for me because I'm like, ah, they're so close to each other. But there's no circulating air in there. So you're fine as long as the gluten-free item is on top. Uh, other appliances um, like blenders, food processors, that kind of stuff, you have to clean it thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly. Okay, thoroughly, thoroughly. We don't want any any chunk of something stuck to the bottom of a blade. Um, so just be very careful. I think that is all that I will say to that. Uh, Megan or Megan, I tried to download the gluten-free 24 seven app, but was not allowed me because I have an Android. Yeah. So unfortunately right now, um, Androids, it, this isn't working for, this is work getting worked on. Hopefully this is going to um, be rectified soon. I'm so sorry. Hang on, hang on with us. And we are going to get that, that sorted out hopefully sooner than later. Um, I hope we put an announcement out when it does, when it does happen. Recently diagnosed with celiac disease. How long does it take for the gut villi to grow and restore itself? Um, welcome to our community, Sharon. Thanks for finding us. It depends on how long you are sick for. So I'm assuming you're an adult, Sharon. Um, I don't know how long you were, you were sick for, but it can take upwards to, of two to five years for your gut to fully heal. Uh, that's what the evidence shows us. Now, children tend to respond quicker. They were not as sick. They're generally not sick for as long and kids are just really resilient. Adults, depending on how much damage has been done, depends on how long it's going to heal for. It depends on how strict you are, how good you are with your diet. Often there, this is why we re really recommend you talk to a dietitian who specializes in celiac disease because we want you to heal as quickly as possible. And if you're eating something that you didn't know had cross-contamination in your kitchen, um, this is why you're attending these things because maybe you would be sharing a, a, a toaster. Maybe you would be... Um, Maybe you would be storing something below something. Maybe you would be dining out, not asking the right questions. And those would be microscopic, small amounts of gluten that you'd be getting exposed to, lengthening the amount of time that it's taking for you to heal. So two years is sort of the average. 
You shouldn't be sick for two years though. You should be feeling better. So although your gut might take that long to heal, you should be feeling a reduction in your symptoms quite quickly, we would hope. Um, and then better and better over time. And remember, your gut doesn't go from this to this. It, it grows, you know, like a tree or a plant would grow. So you will be like, so you might notice I'm taking my iron supplements, but my iron's still not increasing. Well, that could be because there's just not enough absorptive capacity in your gut to actually take in and absorb the iron and utilize it. For people with an iron deficiency on tonight, um, you might want to talk to your doctor about an iron infusion. If you're feeling weak, tired, um, fatigued, brittle nails, hair might be, um, you know, people with iron deficiencies, sometimes there's hair loss. If you're experiencing symptoms like this, that decreases your quality of life. We don't want you to suffer and taking iron supplements might not be, might not work for you. So we might want to, you might want to go to your doctor and talk about, um, getting an iron infusion instead as an, as an alternative. Um, but yeah, so Sharon, two years up to five, depending on the amount of damage that's been done, but two is about the average. Uh, Marissa, my child was recently diagnosed with celiac disease. Myself, my spouse, and other child have all been tested, and we don't have celiac. How is this possible? What tests do we need to see if uh, we have celiac in the future? Um, great question, Marissa. It is highly possible. Um, remember, people with celiac disease carry one of two genes or both genes, HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8. These are the two genes that celiac disease causes. You could carry both of the gene. You could carry a double of uh, homozygous of one of the genes. You could carry one copy of one of the genes. It, it, depending on the genes that you carry depends on how likely it is that you're going to develop celiac disease. You can get your genes tested by the way. Um, but regardless of that, if you have a first degree relative, um, then you're at increased risk. So is assuming your child is genetically related to you, one of one of either you or your spouse carry one or more one or more of those genes. It's been transfer transferred in the DNA, the way the DNA crosses over, your child got it and they've developed celiac disease. If you carry the gene for celiac disease, you should be tested for celiac disease every two to three years, or if you become symptomatic. Um so that being said, uh, that being said, you don't have to present with celiac disease to carry the gene. 40% of the population has the gene in it. Only 1% of the population develops celiac disease. So hopefully that answers your question. It is entirely possible. Sandy, I cannot sign up for the newly diagnosed program on the Canadian, oh, on the Celiac Canada website, tried on several different devices and it always has a problem occurred. Huh, I'm so sorry about that, Sandy. Let me look into that. Um, Sandy, can you please email info at celiac.ca again? Um, because, and I'm gonna put that in to the chat so that you've got that, everybody, info at celiac.ca. And hopefully we can get that rectified because that shouldn't be happening. Um, thanks for letting me know. Christina, I recently purchased some ice cream. There's a certified gluten-free label on it. After I got home, I looked at the ingredients and at, under may contain, it says wheat. Yes. So Christina, we went through that. Hopefully, um, I answered that question during the, the presentation. May contain is for people with an allergy because they're anaphylactic to wheat. Um, but if there's a gluten-free claim on it, that ice cream is perfectly safe for you to consume. Wes, I'm bummed about our convection oven. Is there a way to clean it and remediate it? Just don't use, okay, so Wes, I'm gonna assume that you have a bake function on your convection oven. Uh, do that or clean it really well. Get the vacuum in there and make sure there's no uh, crumbs. That's the best way to do it. Just suck any crumbs out and then give it a wipe down. Then it should be okay. Again, everything is about risk, guys. We are We are in the business of risk reduction. I can't guarantee anything. I don't know what your oven looks like. I can't guarantee anything, but I can tell you when something is lower risk. And if you do a really good job of cleaning that convection oven, it's gonna be lower risk. Um, or use the bake function. Christina, yes, please expand on the oats and kids part. Uh, did I? I thought, did I do that already? Um, I think I did in a previous question. If I didn't, 
let me know. This was about oat introduction and kids. So I did, I think, expand on that. Catherine, I also can't sign up for the duly diagnosed program. What a bummer. Okay. You know what, guys? I'm just going to see right now if I can. Bear with me for two secs. I wish I had another person on here that could talk. Um, yes, I do. Uh, I'm not two years old. Yes. Sign up. Um, two seconds. Sign up. Thanks for signing up. Okay, I did it, no problem right now. So what is going on with your guys' computers? I wonder. Huh. For those of you who tried, can you try signing up on a different device or are you in the US? Um, that could be an issue. So, or try, yeah, try signing up in a different device or are you in another country? I wonder if those two are things. Um, Susan, I missed the first 20 minutes. Unfortunately, will this be course posted for us? Yes. So Susan, you will get an email with this recording in it and you can watch it again. Rebecca, I'm asymptomatic and newly diagnosed and I'm unsure if it's okay. I'm asymptomatic and newly diagnosed and I'm unsure if it's okay to eat wheat. Oh, definitely not okay to eat wheat, Rebecca. When you get this, um, I'm wondering if you didn't see the whole presentation. When you get the email, watch the whole presentation. No amount of wheat is safe, even if you're asymptomatic. Um, there was a lady earlier who I answered this question with, and um, it was, uh, sorry, my daughter has just come in again. Oh, and it didn't work for Julie. Isn't that interesting? So she's, Julie, my daughter's just tried it and she got an error, an error sign. There was an error in trying to send your message. Please try again later. Um, and that she did it on a phone. I did it on a computer. Do you want to go up to a computer upstairs and try and let me know? Okay, we're going to keep trialing this. Um, she likes to, to sit and listen to these presentations. I'm asymptomatic. Okay, so Rebecca, I need you to know that it doesn't matter. If you are symptomatic or not, the damage is the same. So you cannot have any gluten at all. People who are diagnosed with celiac disease have to be on a gluten-free diet, pure and simple. Doesn't matter the symptom. There's no threshold for damage. There's a threshold for symptomology though. Oh, oats. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, Rebecca. I should have seen that. I didn't. Um, is it safe for you to eat oats? Uh, regular oats? No. Gluten-free oats? Yes. Um, related to brow ingredients, Christy, malt flavoring, is it okay? No, um, malt is barley and it should say bar bracket barley on an ingredients list. If there's no bracket after the malt, report the product um, or call the company. I rarely say to call a company, but I would call the company and say, is your malt not made with barley? Because that would be really unusual. Um, just got a report from somebody else who has signed up and it worked for them. How strange. Okay, let's keep, we'll keep plugging away at this. Thank you guys for bringing that up. Um, the mall question, it should have bracket barley. That's the legal way to say it. Um, yeah, call the, call the company and, and find out because there, there might be malt flavorings that don't contain barley. There, you know, in, in this one thing I'm finding, the food industry is moving faster than my brain can keep up. And, and I'm getting, we're getting painted into corners sometimes with food because we're, the food industry is getting so creative and it's making it harder and harder for us to figure things out. Um, so we really have to just kind of ground ourselves, put our feet in the ground and say, I, if it doesn't have, we know that Health Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, monitor these foods. And if it doesn't, if it's not legally represented, then it's not there. So we have to kind of trust in that. Becky, great question. To be tested with celiac disease, do I have to eat gluten first? If yes, for how long? Okay. Tissue transglutaminase, the IgA TTG test that we get tested um, is A, IgA dependent, as well as it's a respondent to gluten in your system. If you, are not, if you have an IgA deficiency, which is about 2% of the people, you will never test positive for TTG. That's the people who have seronegative celiac disease. That's one category. 
Then we have this next cohort of people um, who go to get tested for celiac disease. They've been told to stop eating gluten by their doctor, which happens all the time. See my eye rolls. Um, I work as an outpatient dietitian and I've got a lot of clients who come to me and say, well, my doctor told me to stop eating gluten, see how I feel. That's not helpful for us in our, in your diagnosis, really not helpful. Yes, you have to have gluten in your system to trigger the TCG test to be accurate. If you don't have gluten in your system, then you run the risk of a false negative. How much gluten do I have and have, how much gluten do I have to have in my system and how long do I have to have eaten gluten before the test? Again, I've heard doctors say, eat gluten the night before, you'll be fine. No, you won't. That's not how this test works. So go to our website or go and, or, and type in gluten challenge at the top and find and then find on our page all the instructions for the gluten challenge. We have a video there as well that walks you through. If you're a learner through video, it's there. If you're a learner through words, it's there. Um, it will walk you through how much and for how long. So there's the minimum amount of time that you have to be eating gluten for is four weeks. And the minimum amount is about a piece and a half of bread, 75 grams of pasta, eight crackers, about that per day. You then get the TTG test. If it's still negative, you go on to continue challenging until the 12 week mark. And then you test again, if it's negative, then the TTG is negative unless you're IgA de deficient, but you should have been tested for that alongside with the TTG testing. In Ontario, this works for most provinces. Okay, so my daughter tried it again and it worked on her computer. I wonder if this is a phone thing. If anybody else has the desire to try signing up for it on their phone, let me know in the chat, not in the Q&A. Um, what was I saying? Ah, thank you. If you are in Ontario, this is where the this is where there's a problem. Ontario, the testing is free one time. Um, for that initial screen. So if you get a negative and then you go on to challenge again, you'll have to pay for that second test. Everywhere else um, in Canada, it's free. It's a free test all the time. So um, what I would suggest you do is a gluten challenge for about eight weeks and then test and see how you see how it goes. T figure out what time of day the gluten works for you, whether um, you want to have gluten at night and try to sleep through your symptoms, or maybe the symptoms, your symptoms are so bad that it's ruining your night's sleep and you would rather deal with it during the day. Um, you do have to have gluten in your system for a TTG test to be a true positive. Otherwise you run the risk of a false negative. Um, that is a really important piece. Okay, Rachel signed up, no problems from my iPhone. How interesting, Susan, I have never a newer Android and it worked. Might be older phones. Um, Becky says, try to clear your cache if you're having issues signing up in the website. Ooh, that's a good point. I'm not a techie. So thank you tech people who are out there helping out. Um, okay, I've got several questions left. I'm gonna try to go quickly. Um, thanks everybody who's hanging on. I'm about one month of going gluten-free correlated with my Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Those two go hand in hand. They share a gene. And my GP just diagnosed, and my GP just diagnoses with non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Should I get the endoscopy to check to see? Um, okay, you've been gluten-free for two, for a month. You've been told you've got non-celiac gluten sensitivity. You've never been tested for celiac disease, I'm assuming. Should I get the endoscopy to check to see? <sighs> Up to you. This is up to you. So the question is, should this person go on a gluten challenge in order to find out if you have celiac disease or not? You've been gluten-free for a month. You feel so much better now. That would be my question. Do you feel a lot better? If not, I'd reintroduce gluten and I'd get tested. Being a month gluten-free, remember we said it takes years for the, you know, up to two years for your gut to heal. A month gluten-free isn't so worrisome. I would do a challenge and I would do the shorter challenge and I would get tested. I would do the TTG test. Um, I would I would want to know if I have celiac disease versus non-celiac gluten sensitivity for a couple of reasons. An official diagnosis with celiac disease allows you to 
access the tax credits. It, it also will open the door for you to have access to medications when they become available. Remember, these medications are being tested on people with diagnosed celiac disease. If you have not been officially diagnosed with celiac disease, you might not have access to the medication or you might not have access to the medication for free. Your plans might not cover it. So we wanna make sure that we open every door for you um, in order to access those medications. So um, Renaf, I would do the gluten challenge, um, but it's entirely up to you. If you feel, if you are in a time in your life where you're like, I can't handle that right now, then, the, you know, all of these are individual choices. Um, meet with a dietitian who knows a lot about this and have that conversation. Andy was able to sign up, no problems. Okay. Catherine, how do we find comfort or trust in eating out or eating food from other people? I'm worried that serve as a restaurants. Yeah, this is going to take time and it's going to take conversations and it's going to take a bit of a leap of faith. Um, my husband has been sick many times from eating at friends' houses who have sworn up and down that they were extremely careful. They've shown me the butter that was fresh that they used um, and, and he's gotten sick. <sighs> It's tough. Um, at, that's why I said you will find your restaurants and you will be good patrons of those restaurants. You'll go back several times because, you know, restaurants are getting better and better about being gluten free, about the language of what is gluten free. How do I keep people safe? They are getting better. The CCA is advocating for it. Friends and family have those conversations with them beforehand. Obviously, it's not when you're there. Go, oh, by the way. It's a conversation beforehand. You can say, you know, I'm going to bring an appy or I'm going to bring part for a potluck so that, you know, there's something that's safe for you to eat. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can navigate, but um, time is going to, is going to help with that and, and conversation empower and educate people around you so that they know this isn't you overreacting. This isn't you being, you know, a nervous Nelly. This is you, you in, a, in your medical condition and it is serious and you will be very sick. Is there any way I can catch this from the beginning? Yes, you can. Ashley, we will send you the full uh, the full thing. Um, Mona, are microwave uh, risk for cross-contamination? No, they should be fine. Um, you know, if you're concerned at all, uh, cover it, um, but no, it's fine. Susan, Applebee's manager told me that their dry ribs even though they were in the same fryer as everywhere else had been tested. Nope, 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 nope. Um, to be less than 20 parts per million. Nope, 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 nope. If they're in a fry, if they're in a shared fryer, there's no way Applebee's tested the end product to be safe for people with celiac disease. There's no physical way that they did it. So that unfortunately, that manager is just with best intention, is not giving you safe advice. No shared fryer in a restaurant is safe. It has been clinically proven through studies um, that, that it's just not. The product going in might've been gluten-free, but the product coming out would not be gluten-free. Um, okay, Catherine, sorry if I missed this earlier. Is celiac something you are born with or can you develop it during a lifetime? You can develop it, develop it at any time. So uh, Winston is saying hi. Um, you can develop celiac disease as a child. My daughter was five. You can di be diagnosed with celiac disease in midlife. My husband was in his forties. You can be diagnosed later in life. My mom was diagnosed. Well, I guess she was still in her midlife. She was diagnosed in her late fifties. Um, anytime, oldest person, 101. This is a gene that can be triggered throughout your lifetime and you can develop it at any time, which is why people who have a first degree relative with celiac disease need to be tested throughout their life to make sure that their gene hasn't suddenly switched on. Um, Sandy, my doctor seems to think I should wait to start taking an iron, should wait to start taking an iron until I've been gluten-free for a while. This is okay. So Sandy, the reason your doctor is saying this is because you're not going to absorb the iron. It's going to go right through you because of the villus atrophy. Um, if you are very symptomatic and you are feeling crummy, you are feeling weak, tired, um, short of breath, brittle nails, you know, all the list of things, cold that an iron deficiency or an iron deficiency anemia causes. I would ask for an infusion. If you have official anemia, if your hemoglobin is low, if your hemoglobin is below 120, I would ask for an iron infusion. If your ferritin is low, but your hemoglobin is normal, you do not have anemia, you have a deficiency. 
this is getting into a bit technical terms, but I'm, I'm giving you this information, Sandy, just so it empowers you a little bit to know what you want to push for. If your ferritin is low, you're not, you're not really symptomatic. You can wait because your hemoglobin hasn't been affected. Ferritin's your stored iron. It's, it's your iron that's, you know, you it's in your cupboard. Your hemoglobin is the food in, on the plate in front of you. If you run out of that, you go to your cupboards for more food. That's what the ferritin is for. Um, right now you've got enough food on your plate. If your hemoglobin is normal, you're just, your stores are depleting. So we want to make sure that you are feeling well. At the end of the day, it's all about patient, best patient practice. Um, so that's what I'm going to say about that. Andy, I was diagnosed in the fall. My GP said I had to follow a gluten-free diet, but didn't suggest any other follow-up testing. Um, okay. So Andy, great question. When you are diagnosed with celiac disease, you should have your TTG tested at the six month mark, your TTG tested at the year mark. If it is still high, your TTG tested six months later. If it is still high, six months later, once your TTG has normalized, we want to test that annually. Okay. Truth be told, none of us probably do that. It's probably more like every year or two. If you have had, a, like my daughter, a point a point five or lower TTG every time she gets tested, you get to be a little lackadaisical. I'm like, chances are I'm not going to bring her in for blood work just to get another another good reading, especially if she hasn't been symptomatic. Um, but if she's going in for other blood work, we're going to throw that in. Okay. So I, again, textbook, we want to do it every year and every six months until that TTG is normalized. Now, we also know that people with celiac disease often have low iron, often have low vitamin D, often have um, can have wonky thyroid levels, often have li uh, liver enzyme issues. So we might want to get those tested. Um, and then what moving forward, if you have a D deficiency, if you have an iron deficiency, we get those tested on a regular basis until they have normalized, and then you get them tested annually. If you were diagnosed with celiac disease because you had several bone fractures, you might want to have a bone density test done. Um, if you if bone if osteopenia osteoporosis isn't your thing with celiac disease, then you won't. Talk to your doctor about it. On our website, there's a management page. On that management page, it has all of this information. So go to Celiac Canada's website, look up management, and you'll find all of this. Great question. Kathleen, nuts from Costco are okay to eat as long as there's no, yeah, yes, that is true. Sandy, I've, I'm on, tried on four devices in Canada, all different browsers. Man, Sandy, what a drag. Email, um, we'll go to a friend's house and see if it works there, but that is a real bummer. I, yeah. Ashley, is there any other ingredient name that I could look up for other than barley, rye, wheat, triticale? Uh, and regular oats, for example, soy sauce, if it doesn't mention it, <sighs> I've seen one no name soy sauce here that didn't have bracket wheat in it. I would call the company and I would ask. And if that company says it contains wheat, they need to be reported to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Um, look up CFIA and there's you can find where, where to report a product. One report from the CFIA and they will follow up on it. It doesn't take multiple reports to need to be put in. They will follow up one single complaint. Um, the reason I'm a bit more hesitant with something like soy sauce is it's typically contains wheat unless it says gluten-free on it. Um, but according to the regs, if it doesn't, it should be safe. I'd call the company first, ask them. Uh, and then move on from there. Susan, I was able to sign up on an Android phone. Okay, thank you, Susan. I love how this the the team is all helping. I don't understand why you would want to eat gluten. Um, okay, I don't understand why you would why you would want to eat gluten to be able to do that test if your endoscopy did a biopsy and it showed celiac. It was my understanding, Susan, that the person had not done an endoscopy. If I read that wrong, my apologies. If you have had a positive endoscopy, that is a diagnosis of celiac disease. You do not have to go backwards. Um, it was my understanding that they were doing the gluten challenge to have an endoscopy. If I read that wrong, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take all that back and say, if you've had an endoscopy, that's a gold standard diagnosis. You do not have to do a gluten challenge. Thank you, Susan, if, that, if I caught that wrong. 
Megan, newly diagnosed through biopsy in November and TTG in May of last year. GI now asking to do blood tests in January, but told me to go off gluten. What test be accurate? Hold on. Biopsy in no newly diagnosed biopsy was past November. TTG was in May. Now ask and do a blood test in January, but told me to go off gluten. You should be go off gluten. You've been diagnosed with celiac disease. You are never going to eat gluten again. Um, we want to see your TTG coming down. That's the whole purpose of this TTG. We don't want it to be positive. We want to see this negative TTG. We want to see your, your TTG. Listen, guys, we want the trend line to be coming down. Let's say your TTG was 130. Um, and then at the six month mark, we see your TTG is 86. And then the one year mark, your TTG is 20. And then the 18 month mark, your TTG is four. Then we're good. Um, we wanna see that trend line coming down. As long as your trend line is going in the right direction, we're happy. You do not have to go on a gluten challenge if you've been diagnosed with celiac disease. We don't want you to. Donna, interesting. Uh, as I have the HLA DQ5 gene as per the HLA, uh, HLA lab and celiac confirmed by endoscopy. Hmm. Okay, well, celiac confirmed by endoscopy, you've got celiac disease. Jen, is there an age you suggest asking your family doc to test children? Great question, three years old. So children below the age of three often have an IgA deficiency. It is not because they are going to have a lifetime IgA deficiency. It is an age-related thing. Their system just isn't up and running fully yet. So um, doesn't mean you don't test them. So if a child is severely sick and you have a parent who has celiac disease, you can do a test, a TTG test, if it's negative, we will take that as a potential false negative. If it's positive, then we can go ahead with a biopsy, um, and or we can go ahead with a uh, with um, a non biopsy way to diagnose. It probably wouldn't be that high in an infant though, um, but uh, three years old is when the immune system should be working well enough that that IG is of abnormal level. So first degree relatives start getting tested after three years old. In BC, vitamin D blood test requisition can't be sent by a family doctor. At least that's what I was told. I would need my get. Oh, no, it can be ordered by a family doctor. You might just have to pay for it. Um, yeah, vitamin D can definitely be. I'm in BC, Aaliyah, as you know. Um, and I've had my vitamin D levels tested. My daughters have had their vitamin D levels tested. Our GP ordered them. So that's un unusual, um, but because it, it can be done. Catherine, my dad is celiac. I was diagnosed with a blood test um, with very high results. In December, my biopsy and scope consultation is scheduled for late May. My doctor and dietitian said because of the delay, I should go uh, go gluten-free until my consultation and then reintroduce gluten. On the Okay, so that is one approach, Catherine. Uh, that is one approach to do. It is not the approach that I took with my daughter um, or the approach I took with my, I said, I, I didn't take with my husband. He makes his own decisions, but it wasn't the approach I suggested my husband take either. I'll tell you why. Um, I like to go on a, I love wait lists. Get me on a wait list because I know as a dietitian who works in the system, wait lists are often the faster way to get seen. My daughter was, was taken in on a wait list. So was my husband. So if you will go on a wait list and you get a phone call saying, can you come in tomorrow for an endoscopy? Um, you cannot do enough of a gluten challenge before that. It, there's just not enough time. If you are not worried about how quickly you can die, be, how quickly you are diagnosed, then that's something to consider. The other thing I want you to consider is when you go gluten free and your gut starts to heal, your gut becomes much happier. When you introduce gluten to a happy gut, you can have a, a higher response than you would have. So um, we see quite often people who are healed and feeling well, if they have a tiny, you might think you're asymptomatic. And then suddenly a year later, you have a, you have a cross contamination, you get really sick. It's because as you heal, you can become more symptomatic because your gut doesn't want gluten in its system. And suddenly it's like, whoa, what are you doing to me? So for those reasons, Catherine, I would prefer not to go gluten-free and do a gluten challenge. However, 
autonomy rules here. And, you know, as long as I give you the information, it's completely up to you what you do with it. So um, taking into consideration the option of a wait list and take into consideration the thought that you might be sicker when you reintroduce gluten. Um, how do you test if possible for non-celiac gluten sensitivity? This is a, a diagnosis of exclusion. We have no test for it, unfortunately. Um, my husband has been diagnosed. Last question. My husband has been diagnosed. He is iron deficient. He has low vitamin D, magnesium, and zinc. He has high B12, question mark. Why is this? Um, has he been taking high dose B12 supplements? Has he been taking a thousand a day? High, high B12 isn't dangerous, depending on high, how, how high the levels are. There's a, a number of different reasons. His B12 could be high, but the primary reason people's B12 is high is because of supplementation. Um, but he should be taking a thousand vitamin D a day. Um, if he's taken, if he's low magnesium, he should be taking magnesium, could take a zinc supplement as well. Um, yeah. And, and, and getting those no supplements, huh? Talk to then, then it's out of my scope of practice. Um, so talking to your doctor about that would be the way to go. Um, through my scope of practice, I would just talk to the, the amount of supplementation. Otherwise it would be, yeah. Conversation with your physician. All right. Oh, last question. Um, what about toothpaste mouthwash? Don't need to be gluten-free. Don't worry about it. Um, they follow into the into the cosmetic category. Great question. Uh, don't worry about them. Okay, super, everybody. Thanks for hanging in with me. Um, 40, yeah, 40 minutes of questions. No, even longer than that, because I stopped at 10 too. 50 minutes of questions. Active group. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining. Um, if you want to come again, you are welcome to come to these as many times as you want. Sign up for a newly diagnosed pathway if you can. I'm going to look into that. Um, hope everybody is safe and well. If you are in Vancouver, I hope you fare the snow well. And uh, thanks everybody for joining me. Check out all of our webinar lineups. Uh, we do one of these every month and we do lots of other webinars. So check out our events page. And we've got lots of exciting stuff coming up this year. So I hope to see you at another event. Bye for now.